Good evening, and thank you for attending AACP's webinar with Dr. Barry Glassman, presenting how to make evidence-based dentistry relevant, AHI, and anterior midpoints in pain management and sleep. I'm Shaylin, the Association Manager for the AACP, and I will be the host of tonight's webinar. The webinar will be 50 minutes in length, followed by a 10-minute Q&A session. Please enter any questions you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. The AACP has no conflicts of interest. Registrants can expect to receive a recording of this presentation within 10 to 14 business days, and members of the Academy attending live will receive their CE Certificate of Attendance within 30 days of the webinar air date. Our next complimentary webinar will be February 15th with Dr. Richard Mirren presenting new trends in PRF therapy. I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Barry Glassman. Dr. Glassman is a fellow of the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain a fellow of the International College of Craniomandibular Orthopedics and a diplomate of the American Academy of Pain Management. He is a member of the American Academy of Orofacial Pain and the American Headache Society. He is a popular international speaker on the topics of oral facial pain, temporomandibular joint dysfunction, orofacial pain, occlusion, and dental sleep medicine. With that, I will hand it over to Dr. Glassman. Thanks, Ellen, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, this is a, a, a topic dear, dear to my heart and, and, and one that can be uh, uncomfortable uh, because uh, it reveals and goes back to our histories that, that many of us, or with gray hair at least, uh, participated in it at a significant level and uh, has in many cases, uh, because of the lack of evidence in, in our in our in our history, and as we moved out of the odontogenic world into the non-odontogenic world of sleep and pain, uh, took with us some of this empirical information that has uh, led some of us uh, down a rather treacherous path and down a long path uh, that um, uh, that really needs to be uh, corrected. Uh, uh, so as, as for uh, the older people uh, that were, that, that are my colleagues and friends that uh, at the AACP, uh, this is a, a lecture that suggests why we've made the changes we've made and, 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 and how we've made them and how important they are. And for the younger people, it's really, uh, it's really important. Uh, I think that um, because sleep and pain weren't part of our undergraduate education and still remain not part of the undergraduate education, uh, that's problematic enough. But add to that the fact that so much of dentistry itself is, is in fact uh, empirical and rather definitive and, uh, and, uh, and what I call a closed science. Uh, uh, yes, there are advances regularly, but so much of the science is well understood that we took, uh, when we moved in the non-onogenic world, we took that that model with us. So I'm, I'll be referring to a model change, which really is an internal change that each of us uh, need to consider as we uh, are entrusted with our patients' uh, significant symptoms that can alter their lives and the ways that we can, in, in their best interest, um, doing the least we have to do uh, to, to gain the maximum result um, uh, in terms of improving the quality of their lives and, and how we make those decisions. Uh, disclosures, I'm on the medical board of the TSOI, which is a, a board, a, a medical biotech company. We're doing uh, stem research, stem cell research uh, for cancer and uh, 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 lung disorders, et cetera. Also Alzheimer's, very exciting um, uh, uh, research. Uh, partner of, U of S4S USA, which has brought in a, a Morpheus appliance into the United States. Uh, it's um, an anterior midpoint stop, uh, titratable appliance. Um, of course, I get honorarius for non-speaking and, uh, and and do some teaching uh, for their for uh, a sem for my seminars. 
Uh, if I looked at the objectives, well, what I wanted to accomplish today, I think I think we, we covered this initially uh, when I talked about uh, recognizing the raw evidence and how how it's misunderstood and how it's gotten a bad name uh, and how it really needs to be used. Uh, so what is, what is our role when we're looking at oral facial pain in sleep medicine? Uh, when we refer to structuralism, what what where is that problematic, and how did that start, and and how do we defeat that that those concepts, uh, and while at the same time accept that some of those concepts have some validity, so we start moving into from causation concepts into contributing factors concepts. So rather than thinking of things of, of what causes is this cause I I did A and then B happened, so therefore. A was caused by, um, um, the disease was caused by A. Uh, and then when, when that happens, unfortunately, we then expect that same result to happen uh, to, to, to the next patient that walks into our offices. And of course, many times it doesn't happen. And many times we find ourselves justifying why it didn't happen. And we, the, the point of tonight's, tonight's time together, and I appreciate the time, but the point of tonight's time together is to get us past that. Um, to not look at, uh, at, 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 even in terms of using the word success and failure, how many times were you successful, Dr. Barry? Well, that's, that's, that's really not a good question. And, and, and hopefully after tonight, we'll understand that. Uh, why is evidence-based medicine associated with this model change? Why, 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 why do we, why, what, what is this model change that I keep referring to? And why, why is that necessary? And then, then we take some examples and some evidence in, 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 some of the concepts and I chose AHI because um, there's so much happening in, in sleep medicine uh, uh, as we begin to understand and that many of us have been talking about the problems associated with AHI for years and finally uh, medicine has now gotten to the point where it, it has recognized it, it has come up with a with a, an a, a outlandish really because it's not ready for prime time yet concept of high, hypoxic burden to replace it but at the same time um, we don't have all the evidence that we need there. Uh, and there is something very new and exciting called RE or, or respiratory effort uh, that, that we think is going to be a, a compilation and, and potentially replace AHI. And, and, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll get to some of that tonight. Uh, examples of how evidence based medicine can be relevant in oral facial pain and sleep. When we look back on our history, it's a, um, there's a paper that I wrote with Don uh, Malaysia uh, on the curious history of occlusion in dentistry, and <clears throat> it, we look back on, on on all the history, and we find that in in, in 1868, Angle proposed orthodontics should be the science of dental occlusion, and that the class one occlusion was uh, should remain the goal, and it's remained the goal for 75 years. Uh, of course. At this point, we are aware that no evidence suggests that there's any relationship between the, the either the molar classification or the canine classification when it comes to pain or dysfunction. <clears throat> but nevertheless, it still remains a, a, an orthodontic goal. Um, uh, how those teeth come together when the masseter and temporalis go into permanent contraction, even though, as we know, maximum intercuspation almost never happens in, in, in function, but yet it remains... Uh, uh, it remains uh, an orthodontic goal. In 1901, Carley, without any evidence, theorized that the abnormality of the and that malocclusion was the basis for any joint dysfunction, any masticatory muscle dysfunction, periodontal disease, and bruxism. And and you know it was 1901, so no one can blame him. Unfortunately, in 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 Pete uh, Dawson's third edition in 2007, he pronounced Carley got it right. Again, looking at occlusion as the number one treatment regimen, the cause and therefore the resolution of pain or dysfunction. Uh, things got worse in 1934 with Costin, who was an uh, otolaryngologist and uh, who looked at 11 cases and found that, and, uh, that, that decreased vertical dimension wa was um, a, a, a part of these 11 cases a uh, structural issue. And then they looked at various signs and symptoms. And when he improved the vertical dimension, he went at the, the signs and symptoms on these 11 patients seemed to improve. So as a result of that, he, made the, he went ahead and pre presented this mechanism that was related to pressure of the condyle and, and, uh, 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 so that we had less pressure uh, um, on the tympanic plate, uh, the, on meniscus, 
or what they call the meniscus or the, or the disc, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and to this day, there are people who still put fingers in their ears to see if they can feel pressure to, to determine whether or not that may be associated with, with, um, uh, with whatever signs or symptoms we're experiencing. Uh, uh, that became the basis for many upcoming pioneers. And I call them pioneers because they were people like uh, um, May and, uh, and Gelb. And um, and even to this day, uh, Costum uh, syndrome is still uh, referenced and diagnosed. It's really important to understand that there was uh, no there there is no evidence whatsoever that the mechanisms that he descri described were were accurate. And there were also problems with the with with the study. Uh, for example, he, he proved that one patient. Uh, his hearing improved because when he spoke to them, the patient said he could hear more clearly from visit one to visit two. I, you, you can't make this up. Uh, TMD camps are led by gurus and the structural causation became the key. Where to put the condyle? Uh, how good was the occlusion? Um, uh, diagnosis was centered on, on symmetry, how important symmetry was. And if you were asymmetrical, you you therefore uh, were were problematic and and that was the cause of your pain. If we could make you symmetrical, uh, then all, all of your head pain, neck pain, and shoulder pain would go away. Um, uh, when people who were doing these doing this, and this is how I was trained uh, early in in my career from Miles Gachet and 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 uh, neuromuscular concepts, etc. When 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 uh, that was questioned. When that was questioned, we all looked and said, oh, this, oh, it works in our hands. We know this works. Uh, we know why it works. Uh, and it, this is just ivory tower asking for evidence when, uh, and, and slowing down progress. That's honestly uh, how I was trained and how we felt. Um, the, the, the new line of thought association between oral health and occlusion, oral facial pain, as well as general health and pathology. What was missing was you know, any evidence in terms of causation, um, and there's an upcoming quote from Emerson that I that, I, that I, I'm, I'm eager eager to get to about making these kinds of leaps of faith in terms of um, mechanism, and this really became the birth of logic in the absence of science. It made sense that if everything was balanced and even, then we would be in normal function and we would be we would be pain free. So then in the 50s comes uh, Fonder and his DDS or dental distress symptom. And again, empirically with no controlled studies, uh, he altered relationships that were causing what he was calling stress. Now, uh, stress and all allostatic load and uh, moving out of the homeostasis range, uh, patient's adaptive capacity, all we've turned, turned out to be extremely important when we talk about neuromodulation or when we talk about the why certain patients respond differently to the same to the, to, to the same stimuli, um, oh, so it's not that stress isn't isn't critical, and the oxidative stress obviously is, is critical, and it's not that that internal stress isn't critical. But what we're talking about now structural stress that led to an alteration of C one and C two. Um, sounds like uh, uh, he was the first upper cervical uh, chiropractor in, in his own way. And, and his goal was to ch change the mandibular posture to improve C1, C2. And as a result of that, uh, <clears throat> he corrected the following. From sinusitis to tonsillitis to OBGYN, fertility and miscarriages, allergy, headaches, backaches, equilibrium stability, uh, of course, ED, emphysema, mononucleosis, epil epilepsy, and, I, and, and go on. And this is Fonder. Uh, a great fan of Fonder was Harold, and Harold Gelb came up with a, with where the condyle is supposed to be, and uh, in and as opposed to at that point where 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 Pete Dawson was suggesting where that condyle was supposed to be, and I worked with both of them, and uh, both of them incredible people, incredible people, and we wouldn't be where we where we are today without these pioneers. But just like great pioneers of the American history, um, we certainly are appreciative of their efforts, but we wouldn't want to today follow their maps. And the suggestion that 
that all we need to do is get that kind of eye on the right position and everything will line up properly and, and the, the physiology will automatically change. When in some cases it did, which led us then to what we're going to talk about is confirmation bias. So there's a so we were we were under this structural uh, period where everyone was looking at structure and things that the dentist could do physically with appliance therapy, with a coil abrasion, with adjustment therapy, and we could do whatever the to, in order to get the ideal occlusion, which would lead them to improved function. And we're suggesting that a model change, an internal model change. Uh, an external model change is required because this logic doesn't work. It's literally in the absence of science. This is an empirical history where theory, and to this day, theory gets taught as fact. And uh, the, this, uh, the, the issue of structuralism becomes uh, the number one issue. Uh, if, briefly, if, if we were to look at um, a disc position, and uh, I've heard it say how important a disc is and where that disc is and how important it is to get the disc back. And yet, um, you know, 35 to 40% of our patients, our adult patients, have some form of an internal derangement that totally asymptomatically to which they have um, totally adapted uh, and have no pathology and will not have pathology as a result of this altered disc position. Uh, so it, it clearly isn't, structural and the answer to that patient's left-sided joint pain is not going to be alter the condylar position so that we can get the disc into place. Um, so what is this model change then? It's, a, it's, uh, it's changing the model that one in the way we learn so that we don't learn just through em empiricism. Two, it's to change the way we we anticipate to move from a dental model where we are can be predict can predict success, we can look. We know the bugs that cause periodontal disease. We know it causes uh, decay. We know how we can do incredibly incredible things in restorative dentistry that us old folks never got to do. Um, it's amazing what our restorative concepts and our our restorative procedures can take us through. But if we take the, uh, the, that, that, that model where we can predict success and bring it to non-odontogenic sleep and pain, it puts a tremendous amount of strain and pressure on the practitioner to one, adjust or alter reality so that he, rather than facing failure on a regular basis, he can convince himself or, or console himself in finding some levels of success beyond what may be the reality. And, and I've watched all the gurus do exactly that. I've watched many of the instructors of today do exactly that. We need to be, we need to have answers. We need to connect the dots. Um, dentistry is the state of the odontogenic uh, uh, disease patterns is well known. Most of the dots can be readily connected. Not the case. It's not the case and the, with, with pain and sleep. And, and, and there's much that isn't known. And as a result of that, uh, our job becomes making good risk benefit decisions based on what is known as well as our clinical experience, which We'll get to. So dentistry is cursed as far as I'm concerned. And our dental schools produce vulnerable students to structuralism. We're vulnerable because we've never learned much about the scientific process. We never learn much about a non-empirical history. So what so people misunderstand when I talk about medical model and dental model. What I'm referring to is our approach to evidence, our use of evidence-based concepts. Um, in dentistry, um, there's very few times where we need to manage a patient's disease pattern. We, we cure it. We can cure most of the disease patterns. So in the very beginning, when I started talking about management of, of pain management, 
people were extremely critical. Why would I manage when I can learn how to cure? All right. I'm going to cure the sleep apnea with a with an oral appliance? Of course not. Of course not. Um, I'm going to treat every sleep apnea patient that has an AHI above five because why? Because that's disease. But is it? Are there patients with AHIs of 15 and 20 that don't need to be treated? You bet there are. And are there patients with lower HIIs that need to be treated? Of course there are. So the assumptions that we can look at a single metric, the assumptions that, we, that, that, that the disease is straightforward, that it's simple and we, have, we can pick and we can do something and, 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 and a single thing and make and, and resolve the issue, which of course sometimes happens. Um, uh, but that assumption and that assumption of mechanism when we do something and we assume it happened and that assumption is based in structure can be problematic. Dentistry is spoiled by their need to know. We're spoiled by our science. And we took that expectation and we moved it into pain and sleep. Science is ambiguous. All evidence is provisional. It'll change tomorrow. Um, I don't know, or it's not known is, 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 is not <laughs> problematic to state. It's real. Dentistry entered the field of sleep and pain with an attempts to connect the dots to explain everything. I put the appliance in and moved the kind down the right position. It took pressure off of this. Uh, it balanced the muscular, the musculature got uh, comfortable. The muscles are all happy and now the headaches are better. No. The answer is that is absolutely not. Well, what causes bruxism? Well, we needed to have a cause. I mean, people are brux, what, what causes it? Well, let's see. If I change the occlusion, will the bruxism go away? So, so many, many times, uh, those who are very into a collaboration would see that a patient had pain or dysfunction in a, in a, in a, in a, in a temperament of a joint. They would then equilibrate because the bite needed, the, the bite demonstrated that uh, it could be benefited from an equilibration and the pain or dysfunction would go away. And then the assumption was, well, therefore what? I, the patient stopped bruxing. Stop Bruxing. And every study demonstrates that's, of course, not at all what happened. This is not to say the forces from the protected occlusal scheme didn't change in terms of force vectors and direction, altering the patient's signs and symptoms or contributing to an improvement, getting them within their adaptive capacity and allowing God or Darwin, and I don't want to get in that argument, but <clears throat> resulting in some, in some, uh, a significant healing process metabolically. Um, what causes migraine? I, I to this day, <clears throat> I remember teaching a course and 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 des describing how uh, a specific appliance could alter uh, the, the autonomics so that we could have altered cerebral blood flow, altered um, uh, alteration during REM. Uh, etc. And we could often see a decrease in, in the intensity and frequency of migraine. And there was a doc um, who was in a, 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 a fellow doc at the ACP who, uh, who went out and did a couple of appliances and lo and behold, their migraine, patient's migraines went away. And the next thing I know, he writes an article that says migraine is a TMD disorder. <laughs> no. Obviously not. Mastery requires becoming comfortable with ambiguity. We have to be comfortable with not knowing, with not being 100% sure, with not stating the mechanisms specifically because those mechanisms will change. Some of the procedures I do today are the exact, or I did until I retire, with, with the exact same procedures, some of the procedures I guide people through today, the exact same procedures I did and was trained to do years ago. What's changed? The, the reason for doing them, the mechanism behind it. And what's changed, of course, is the expectation that if I do it perfectly, all the signs and symptoms will go away without accepting in any way, shape, or form what's happening 
in terms of neuromodulation, uh, what's happening in terms of sensory dysregulation in, in that particular patient. Dentists constantly are, are they, they'll go to course after course because they get what they want. This doc, I don't want to go to this course because this gives me the cookbook. This gives me the if A, then B, then C, then D, and then I can follow some logarithm and 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 that's the way I would. The answer is we're treating very complex people. It's not simple. It doesn't need to be simple. Sometimes we can help people and not even be 100% sure why or how we help them. Sometimes it's regression to the mean. Sometimes it's just time. Sometimes it has a lot to do with stress. Sometimes it has more to do with the you believe this or not, whether the, with re, your the relationship and the time you've spent with your patient and 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 your your effect on HPA access and your effect on or on the stress on their lives and what it happens what happens to uh, the stress factors and 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 to the uh, central autonomic system <clears throat> then eventually into the HPA axis, who, all of that, yes, it plays a significant role. Uh, it's, it was hard for me to accept uh, that uh, my relationship with my patient was, 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 a, was a potential factor as opposed to putting the condyle where it was supposed to be with an appliance. So we, we, we can't use cookbooks and, and help the maximum number of people. Uh, we, we, we can't expect to understand all the mechanisms. Um, we can't continue and be as effective and as happy internally ourselves with what we're doing in sleep and pain because the more you know this pain, the more complicated our patients become. And, and expecting that same response in a patient with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, hypermobility, with an appliance therapy, as a patient with without migraine, without sensory dysregulation, uh, uh, it, it is nonsensical. Structuralism is based on the key role of anatomy and symmetry, assuming control over the neurophysiology, ignoring that patient's adaptive capacity and the role of descending inhibition, et cetera. There's an assumption of a direct relationship. And if you're thinking direct relationship, between any two factors in this complicated human that we're, we've, we have the, the, the honor uh, to treat, uh, we're going to be wrong. There is no direct relationship between nociception and pain, not recognizing the, the sensory dysregulation, nonlinear relationship, and the role of uh, nociceptivity. So now we're even looking at non nociceptive input through low mechanic, uh, mechanic receptors. And the reality that patients can have pain in the absence of nociception and, um, and can play a, a major, and this can play a, a, a major role in, in, in their pain pattern. So um, empirical evidence with observ observational stu uh, studies, belief systems are justified with confirmation bias. And there is no one who understands this more than me because there's no one in their history. I'd say, and I, that's, of course, that's not 100%. True. I'm just saying my history was filled with confirmation bias from, from, from camp to camp, from Society of Occlusal Studies to Harold Gelb to neuromuscular uh, to working with Pete Dawson to, uh, from camp to camp. We, we went from, from to, to confirmation bias and waving flags in honor of that camp because they were right. Confirmation bias, seeking or interpreting of evidence in ways that are partial to your existing beliefs, expectations, or a hypothesis at hand. Uh, nothing reminds me more of confirmation bias than people who, and, and again, guilty as charged, going to lectures and listening to someone suggesting a mechanism or an issue with that is not consistent with what I now believe. Uh, I used to sit in the audience with anger and I would almost pick lectures in order to, to go to, 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 to be 
boosted by knowing that what I was going to hear was what I agreed with. So avoiding information that opposes the hypothesis or, or beliefs, of course. Seeking information that supports those beliefs, all part of, all part of confirmation bias. Um, the, the origins of, of structural evidence all came, actually came, it, it, this is a quote from Ackerman talking about how it came from the, uh, from with a with a, from nature with a with a with almost with a religious tone. So that when you listen to the science of occlusion, um, they they put together so called facts uh, uh, under the disguise of principles. That from the beginning there were strong overtones of religious belief, and and this struck me internally, very personally, because uh, in reality, so much of uh, our early training was religious beliefs. I believe in him. I believed in Niles Gouche. I believed in him. And then I believed in Harold Gell. Believed in him. Many times people will ask me, well, let me ask you about what you believe in, in a particular situation. And my answer to that is, honestly, why do you care? What I believe isn't important. What I can tell you is this is what we, we know and this is what we think. But what I believe adds a factor that, that is fair for me to use when I'm practicing, but unfair for me to use when I teach. We are no better than science. Dentistry needs to, has this need to understand the mechanism. The need to simplify is our own misgiving. We want to simplify. We want to take, we want to look at migraine. We want to put it in this appliance. I'm going to then use that appliance and the, and the pain goes away or the migraine's intensity and frequency changes. And then I say, well, that patient was obviously having migraines because they were grinding and clenching. Of course, that's not true. Of course, that's not true. This reduction of a few laws to one law is not the choice of the individual said Emerson in 1904, but is the tyrannical instinct of the mind. It's perfectly normal. We want, we need to, everything we do, everything we do, we do because it's, 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 it's looking at a complicated picture and we have simplified it to a few factors. Our goal is to simplify it to the factors that are, and consider all the potential factors that we know. All the things that could go wrong, all the things that where where it could be more than, but we look and see where most of our patients would respond, and we do the least we have to do to make them better and watch how they respond, and we don't make the assumption that they will respond, and we educate our patient in the same way, so that we can then be honest with ourselves and honest us with our patients and we don't have an agenda to make them better yes i'm going to give you this appliance and you are going to get better no then in two weeks when you come in and you say how are you doing with that appliance you, you usually ask them, so you're better you're doing better with the appliance that we ask that question i've watched people they literally shake their heads giving them the patient the answer they need that answer because they've made that promise the question we ask is so on the nights that you couldn't wear the appliance what caused that is, the, is your pain worse, about the same, or any better? And it's not personal. The answers they give us are not personal because I haven't made the commitment to do anything but my best. I don't usually read slides, but I want to read this from, uh, uh, so bear with me for a second, if you would. This is from Campbell. Time passed and it slowly dawned on us that the problem of facial pain was bigger than we had thought, i.e. just not structural. And it could be completely, couldn't be explained in terms of mechanics. Dentists have every reason to believe in their mechanical arts. Frankly, <laughs> uh, so you're looking at an old guy who never got to restore a, a crown on, a, on an implant because they were just coming in when I left dentistry and moved into sleeping pain. I look at what you guys are doing dentally, and I got to tell you, it blows my mind. It's um, it is amazing. You have dentistry has every reason to be unbelievably proud of what it's accomplished. 
They've developed a system of oral engineering of which they can be justly proud. However, their concentration on the restorative aspects of their profession has to some extent blinded them to the wide implications of pain. Then he goes through, he who suffers pain is, embodies all the complexity, the nobility, the frailty of humanity is, and that the compassion, the precision of the dentist is incomplete without a knowledge of biologic and psychogenic values. As soon as you say psychogenic, people get really upset because they think that what you're saying is, no, you're saying this patient doesn't have anything wrong with them, that, that, that it's psychogenic, it's uh, psychosomatic, and that they don't really have real pain. No, they, they do. Of course they do. And psychosomatic is not at all what we're talking about. We're talking about the role of the autonomics and, uh, and uh, the biochemistry of emotion and the limbic system on their pain. What's amazing about this is that it was Campbell in 1953. Campbell, 1953, about uh, 57. Donoff in 2000 wrote that we've got to get past this concept of it works in my hands. All improvements require change, but not all change is improvement. If we continue to behave as if evidence is bad for patient care, we will continue to foster the clinical adage of it, it, if it works in my hands, it must be good. So great, we'll get, we got to it now. We understand why we need to go beyond the concept of anecdotal and determining what works in our hands. Then we've got to then consider evidence-based medicine and dentistry. Uh, what is it? And Sackett, who is the father of evidence-based medicine, and this is the most misunderstood concept, talked about evidence-based medicine. When he introduced evidence-based medicine, he said it had three factors. One, the best external evidence, quality evidence. Not Yes, you can have evidence that's really bad. I just read an article in the... In, 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 um, in today's world, I just read an article today from the journal Dental Sleep Medicine, um, uh, and it, it, I'm not saying the whole article was bad, but there was reference to a re the relationship between bruxism and the likelihood of having, um, um, a, a, and the association with sleep disturbed breathing in, in children. Uh, and uh, it, it listed bruxism as a, as, as, as a, a, a potential risk factor, um, which... I'm not commenting whether it is or it isn't, except for the fact that they determine bruxism by questionnaire. We continue to use questionnaires for bruxism when we know how irrelevant and then and unrelated uh, uh, the reality is of bruxism to a response on a questionnaire. And to, to, in today's world, it, there's with the tools we have, there's there's just no excuse for that. Based on quality evidence, on good evidence good, independent, uh, unbiased evidence, not easy to find, all right? Clinically relevant access, uh, evidence. Um, now, so one is quality evidence, the preponderance of the quality of evidence. Sure, you can find an article, uh, you can cherry pick an article that's, that, that's, that's for your agenda. You tell me what you want me to prove and I'll prove it through you, through the literature. No question about that. Sure, you can do that. But the good observer and the good learner doesn't find the quality evidence and then reads and goes for the preponderance of that evidence and determines just how valuable that is and how much of a factor he wants that to play in the trio. What's the trio? The second is your clinical experience. No, Sackett never suggested that you had to only follow the evidence. If you only followed the evidence, you would be handcuffed and couldn't treat anybody. I firmly believe that. But if you only followed anecdotally your clinical experience and didn't use the evidence, it's no better than voodoo. So the combination and then the third is patient preference. What it is, it's not a way for purchasers and managers to cut cost of healthcare, but it's become that, right? So third parties use evidence, cherry pick evidence and use it against good quality care. Sad, but true. So, so the tendency then is a knee jerk reaction. See how they're using evidence that sucks and we shouldn't use it. No, that doesn't suck. 
That does suck, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't use it. This is only for the ivory tower people. These, these aren't the people with the wet face. Wet, no, the, 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 some of this evidence is, is wet fingered. It's really good. Some studies have been just mind boggling. If you look at look at the quality studies that were done by Enerdam and Vanderkirk and, and et cetera, when they when they, they demonstrated um, uh, the, uh, the 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 effect in terms of um, uh, mean disease alleviation, comparing oral appliances to to pressurized therapies, it's it, it's incredible. No, medicine's not, you know, listening to it as well as they should, but it, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, it's not restricted to randomized trials and meta-analysis and systematic reviews. There are people that totally misuse meta-analysis. And, and, and no, no question about it, and just in order to publish, don't get me started. But the, the, the reality is it's the, the, yes, you can even go down as low as case studies to get your sense on the preponderance of the evidence if the case study is well done. When properly used, it's not a method to be cherry-picked for agendas or confirmation bias, and I've seen that over and over. We see it really significant right now in sleep medicine when it comes to appliance selection. What is it? It's eliminating confirmation bias, allowing the preponderance of the evidence to guide one's art. We use the science to guide our art and teaches us the differentiation between art and evidence-based concepts. Yes, when we practice, it's an art. We're allowed to practice. We're allowed to do and should do what we feel is best for that patient at that given time, given our clinical experience, as long as it's not contrary to the preponderance of quality evidence. So it plays a significant role. The, the, we, we learned that there's no direct relationship between occlusion, the occlusal scheme, that there are people with wonderful occlusions that have pain and dysfunction and people with screwed up occlusions that don't. Uh, that, that there's some degree of normalcy with ACE that per perfectly symmetrical people that doesn't make you perfectly normal. There's no direct relationship between elevated resting EMGs and pain the way that some are, are, are taught. There's no direct relationship between jaw position or pain and dysfunction. There's no relationship between occlusion and brux. I brux because of the malocclusion. And there's no direct relationship between bruxism and pain. There are lots of people who brux a little and have a lot of pain. A lot of pain, people who brux a lot and have no pain. And yet that doesn't mean that bruxism doesn't play a role in the trigeminal signaling that in, in the long run affects their allostatic load and pain and, and pain pattern. So the model changes is critical. We've got to consider more than symmetry, more than structural. We've got to look at physiology. We've got to understand the role of the limbic system. Uh, and we have to understand if we look at Loser's pain model, which is absolutely fascinating uh, and, and, fa and I found to be so, so valid, that, it, that when you look at nociception and, and, and now nociplasticity, um, and that leads to pain and then suffering and then altered pain behaviors, you can at that point for many of your patients get literally eliminate the nociception, but you won't help them. You won't help them because the pain behaviors are now part of their system. And until we deal with the pain behaviors, simply getting at what, led to the nociception will not be successful. So to simply think that we can look at symmetry or structure and resolve patients' pain across the board is at least problematic. So we have to be more aware of more complicated disorders, increased education, improved our, our, our history taking skills. There's no question that the number one way to, to, to help patients both by gaining information and be starting to develop the relationship that we need in order to provide them the help that they need is with a, 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 a well-taken history. Uh, I do a full year long course in, 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 in pain management. And the reality is, is that a great deal of time is taken not only in looking at all the possible uh, using the, the, the newer classifications of, of pain management, 
of oral facial pain, but emphasizing the role of, of the history and considering and looking to consider conservative, reversible theory, whatever is possible. Education is the path from cocky ignorance to miserable uncertainty. And what we need to do is to work with our, our people, work with our, our fellow dentists, and to understand that ambiguity of science does not mean you need to be miserable. In fact, it's the exact opposite. When you, when you, when you know what you know, and you know what you don't, right? It it's helpful. It's 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 uh, we you you begin to appreciate the incredible complexity with which we are faced on a regular basis. Steps to consider. Please keep in mind that unlearning does not mean that everything we did before this was wrong. When we learn that something is the mechanisms have changed doesn't mean therefore that what we did if what we did helped the patient it wasn't wrong it wasn't wrong it may have been more than we needed to do uh there may have been other things we could have done instead but that's what progress is unlearning releases one's protective mechanisms it's not easy to learn unlearn it's difficult to unlearn uh, and of course a confirmation bias, the tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of existing one's own beliefs. So uh, critical in the model change, enhance uh, patient's knowledge, respect uh, their, their decision, allay unfounded fears, weigh the costs, consider private public health, uh, favor scientifically evidence-based choices was the key there. And um, looking at chronic pain, the successful combination requires a well-developed management skill. It's not simply learning structurally what uh, that, that patient requires. So if I looked at this summary, I would say uh, the dental model teaches us an unattainable goal of perfection uh, that has potential cause of stress and unhappiness, often leading to burnout in the dental profession. We know that. Uh, a dental profession is uh, high on the list when it comes to burnout. We actually teach a course with a, a clinical psychologist on burnout. And as a result of the course, we've worked with many patients, many docs who, whose burnout was exposed. Uh, I think that's obviously why they took the course and, and helped them through that burnout process and improving it. Uh, much of the odontogenic science is well known in terms of prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of disease. We, we know what causes periodontal disease and decay, but that's not the case when it comes to uh, that closed level of knowledge in terms of oral facial pain. The pioneers created models on occlusion and joint posture and balance, a total biomedical model based on symmetry, all based on observation and the logic and logic in the absence of science. But good evidence mounts towards a more complex, non-direct physical relationship with a greater awareness of the neurology, a role of descending inhibition, the hypothalamus input, and the relationship of healthcare practitioner on positive outcomes. Ethically, I think it's a, it demands and requires us to go beyond structure and include the biology, the social, and the psych psychological factors. As soon as we say biopsychosocial model, I have a problem with that oftentimes because many times that suggests that it's either biological or this, this, there's, there's um, all the factors individually then combine into our pain pattern. And I don't think that it represents the, the union behind uh, the bio, biomedical and the, and the social and the, and the psychological as com completely as it needs to. And in fact, there's some really good lit now on quote unquote, the death of the biopsychosocial model, I'm not suggesting that, that uh, the, uh, the emotional concerns uh, aren't critical in, in, in helping our patients. So we're no better than the science. We cannot accept responsibility for that which we can't control, and we cannot control as much as we are, as we are, some of us were taught that we could. We must learn to accept the complexity of many of the situations we face and not expect them to be resolved in a univariate model. And because we did a univariate thing, I, 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 I put it in the appliance and two weeks later, the patient's head, neck, shoulder pain, all improved. Therefore, because we did a univariate 
doesn't mean that all of the contributing factors were then resolved by that piece of plastic. What it means was we happened to pick a contributing factor that played a major role in creating that allostatic load. Our goal is to create a patient-centric model to diagnose and validate a process and simultaneously consider reversible therapies uh, in order to make a good evidence-based risk uh, a benefit decisions making. It's evidence based refers to the preponderance of the quality of evidence, the clinical experience, and three, patient preference. So, structuralism then assumptions uh, one consular position, AHI, and is an anterior midpoint stop uh, section that we, we won't. We won't be able to get to the whole thing. So we'll, we'll, the, the conjugal position is the key to mandibular health. And uh, that, <laughs> again, empirically de derived, and it comes from the 70s, 80s, where camps were developed. And, were, and, 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 I, and I love Pete Dawson. I loved him. I loved Harold Gelb. I loved him. And I know darn well that at the age of 85, when they were both alive, if you put them in a room, only one of them would have come out alive. <laughs> you know, fighting over a, a, a millimeter of a position of a condyle where the first thing you do, have to do in order to position that condyle is bring the teeth into maximum intercuspation, a position in which we know that they're only in about 20 minutes a day or so, and which they're never in or they shouldn't be in during any function. So how is that position so critically important? Um, camps developed where they were, case reports, all camps reporting success, um, uh, and uh, without going into detail, we know that the tra Travel's uh, vicious cycle, which both of their models were dependent on, uh, interferences causing hyperactivity, uh, causing lateral turgoid spasms, we, we, uh, Lund's adaptive theory, et cetera, uh, debunked that years ago, but it still continues to be taught. Uh, in, the, in the 2009 AACP handbook, it says the purpose of anterior repositioning appliances is to address disc displacement, restoring the disc to a more anatomical position and allowing associated skeletal muscles to return to their resting lengths, thereby eliminating myogenic, uh, myogenic pain. Well, which is really fascinating because one, we don't really know much about muscle pain. Um, uh, some increase in glutamate maybe, but we don't really have a, a there's, not, there's not a well-known uh, uh, pathophysiology. And um, uh, I, I'm a strong component to suggest that muscle pain is not the source of the vast majority uh, of pain that is reported. We look at ligament insertions as, as the weak point, but that's more than that. The, the assumption that, the, that if I move the condyle back to where it's supposed to be so that this can get in, then the muscles will get better, uh, doesn't, uh, uh, <laughs> no, no such, no, no, no evidence to suggest that. The disc cannot be returned to its normal position and be stabilized in that position. Well, there's some question as to how the disc can be stabilized in that position in the first place, as we know that ligament damage, the, that ligaments that 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 uh, support that uh, that disc position, those that ligament damage tends to be permanent. And uh, because we put the condyle back, doesn't mean the disc a will go back. And more than that, we know that the disc is in is quote unquote out of position in 35 to 40% of the uh, asymptomatic population. And so with this, there's no references except for demonstration of improved muscular health from a 1993 Williamson reference uh, using resting EMGs. So uh, we talk about joint position and the fact that it is fascinating that uh, all that uh, we know that the dental contact occurs in less than 20 minutes and a 24 hour period. And that what we were taught about pure rotation doesn't occur. So as so as soon as we open the mouth at all, at all, you put anything between the teeth, you will experience some anterior repositioning, some anterior movement of the condyle when the teeth are up against that uh, that appliance. There's no relationship demonstrated between resting EMGs and pain. There's all kinds of literature to suggest that. And then, uh, and then the next example was AHI. Uh, AHI was proposed by Juvenile uh, and demanded in 73, and they decided that an AHI of five should be the lower level. But there was no evidence, there's no evidence, there's no one bit of evidence that suggests AHI of five has anything to do with any uh, comorbidities, any potentially increased comorbidities. Um, 
Now there's an attempt uh, to replace AHI with hypoxic or even ventilatory 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 burden. Uh, that's interesting, uh, but it's not yet ready for prime time. Uh, we don't have a really definitive um, uh, algorithm yet. Uh, and we know the mean disease alleviation is no correlation with AHI. Um, some really interesting work, just so you know, some really interesting work has recently been produced. It's been started about 2000, uh, 2018, but now it's come out on, on mandibular movement on our, uh, and, and its relationship. It's uh, how it, the mandible oscillates uh, no, in, with normal respiration and how that oscillation changes and mandibular movement changes in the presence of respiratory uh, disturbances. Uh, the correlation with that algorithm, Malter is a part of that study, uh, demonstrates pretty significant correlation. And I think that we really, we're hopeful, we really may be onto something. But AHI remains still, without evidence, a major factor in medicine. Um, it totally left UAR as, as obviously as a problematic diagnosis and, and destroyed those so, there's so many people who needed UARS treatment, but because of the lack of AHI, many insurance companies won't cover them, which is sad. And before Gimeno died, uh, when interviewed about AHI and the use of five as normal, his statement was, it was his greatest regret that he ever did that evidence is critically important. I'm going to leave the section out on um, uh, that. This is, these are studies. You, you will get this, the PDF, if you want. These are studies that demonstrate the lack of relationship of AHI to pain. And uh, you'll get the anterior midpoint stop therapy. Uh, we just demonstrate with, the, with anterior midpoint stop therapy, the theories, the suggestion that if you put in an anterior midpoint stop on a patient with an internal derangement, logic in the absence of science suggested joint compression, and everyone said, well, you can only use those for two weeks because you're going to, you're going to smash the, uh, compress the joint uh, because of the lack of posterior support. And we demonstrate in these next few slides how that doesn't happen. We also demonstrate some work from Hasegawa and Morris and Drosti that demonstrate uh, significant decreased trigeminal signaling and decreased um, uh, 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 cerebral blood flow. Uh, much the way uh, we, by uh, by preventing posterior contact, and um, that's the same increase in cerebral flood flow and increase in nasal resistance um, uh, that we see during REM. And the thought as a thought becomes: uh, Can we possibly be helping the the issue with nasal resistance and uh, Bernoulli's principle with destruction or collapse of the uh, of, of the airway uh, more readily uh, with the anterior midpoint stop in place. And we suspect that, uh, that, that, that now the evidence suggests that, uh, though we don't yet, uh, we're, we're hoping to, to see some, uh, some better studies uh, independently done to, to make that suggestion. Uh, the, the key for us then, I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna go to the end. Stuff you know, stuff you don't know, and stuff you know, you don't know. <laughs> and we know where the max, the most of that is. So if I were to make a look at this and summarize in general, avoid agendas and dogma, be aware we all tend to, to be the tyrannical, have the tyrannical instinct of the mind to move multivariate situations into univariate and then to use confirmation bias to prove that. Progress doesn't disprove your previous successes. Be open to altered mechanisms to other explanations of what you've found successful. Consider using the concept of contributing factors over causation. Appreciate the complexity of pain and the role of 
sensory dysregulation when you interview your patients. If your patient's a migraine patient, whether they're uh, uh, chronic migraineurs or daily mi or, 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 or episodic migraineurs, whether they're uh, 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 whatever the two are or not, or if your patients are migraine patients, there's a good chance that they're uh, uh, they're the patients who are have some degree of sensory dysregulation. Migraine is nothing more than well, is, is migraine. A part of migraine is misreading normal signal, sensory dysregulation. And if they misread normal signal, it wouldn't be unusual if that trigeminal system is elevated that they will be the kinds of patients that respond to uh, occlusal changes more, more significantly to, to, your, to your, your injection therapy, to anything you do. They're the ones you, you need to go a little bit more carefully with. I feel the same way about hypermobility. So when we look at phenotypes, where are the patients that are more likely to respond negatively uh, to what we're doing in general dentistry? Appreciate the complexity of pain and the role of the sensory of des uh, sensory dysregulation, and keep in mind the four agreements is something we teach on a regular basis. But uh, Miguel Ruiz went and he created the fifth agreement. The fifth agreement was listen to everything I've just said, but be skeptical. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening, Shailen. Ah, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Glassman. Um, great a presentation and we thank you for your time. We do have a few questions. I think we can uh, get through a couple. Sure. Um, one would be, well, what would be an example of a verbiage you typically use to communicate with a patient the complexity of their condition and, and ambiguity of the evidence and how to approach it? You know, that's a spectacular question. Um, and uh, because one of the things that comes out of what we what we talked about tonight is that um, the soft skills are literally as important, if sometimes more important than the hard skills. Um, and those that communication is absolutely absolutely critically important. I've long felt and discovered in my own uh, from my own work uh, that that initial examination is absolutely critical. And then in, not examination, sorry, the examination is not as nearly as critical to me as some people think it is. Nothing's more important than, than that history. And the history, um, once we develop a relationship and the patient appreciates the fact that you listen to them, then what you tell them is easier. Those of us that are involved in sleep and pain should never, ever, ever, ever take a history in a dental chair in a dental setting. So, I could give you the verbiage and I'll give a suggestion of that, but the environment and what, how that verbiage is set up is as important as the verbiage itself. And we always tell people, patients that our goal is to do the least we have to do in order to help them. And that there is no magic bullet. And many of the patients, by the time they got to us, and certainly the case for many of you, they've seen three, four, or five docs, and they've all told them they've all done things and told them this would get better. And 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 people are smarter than that. Um, one of the reasons I said, and to whoever's asking this question, this is really important. One of the reasons I said you don't want to be in a dental setting. There's something about our dental history that we talked about tonight that says I fix things. You can go to your doctor. He can do your migraines. But you come to me, I fix your migraines. I'm the dentist. They expect that from the dentist. More than they expect from, you know, a, a physician can give Topamax and the patient come back and, and say, they, well, I'm in more pain and I, and I can't think and, and my hands are numb. And, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the neurologist would say, well, no, let's, let's kick the Topamax up to uh, 75 milligrams. You know? And fine. A uh, patient comes to me to you after you've given them an appliance and two weeks later, their pain's worse. If we haven't set this up right, they're mad. This is supposed to get better. I paid $700 for this appliance. Why isn't this better? Right. So anticipating that and learning that. So uh, they know when we did, we are already, so we're going to start with this, this appliance therapy. Obviously this isn't a magic bullet. You know, it has the potential uh to uh, to to make you better over time uh we're going to see in a couple of weeks and the goal in a couple of weeks is just to see how often 
uh, and, and how significant, how, how, how you're able to wear the appliance. Uh, if you have any, any, any issues with the appliance and you can't wear it, call us in advance. Now they come back and, 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 and again now, so I've already set up that I'm, now you, if you walk in and you say, how you doing? What's the message? The message is, I'm hoping you're doing better. I would never say that. I would say, so two weeks ago, we gave you this appliance. On the nights you couldn't wear the appliance, what caused that? When it becomes obvious that you care more about them than you, then it's not your success, but their improvement that matters. So much of the battle is won. We didn't have angry patients. We treated really, really sick people. And we didn't have angry patients. Patients often came to our office angry. And my staff would say, oh, man, you're not going to like this one, Dr. Barry. And oftentimes within months, they were different people. Not because I had the special techniques and special appliance and the anterior midpoint stuff that I often use. No, no not because. No, of course not. They were working with somebody who cared and they knew it. Then I would say, then on the, on the day, on, would you say your pain is worse? about the same or better. I always start with worse. I give them that option and I don't, there's no agenda here. I want, I want the truth. Well, to tell you the truth, Dr. Barry, that's, it's worse. It's significantly worse. No, oh, that's good. And they look at me, say, what do you mean that's good? I said, well, let's think about it. You've had this pain for, you know, five years. You came in, we gave the, this different design with a diff specific concept in mind. And in two weeks, it made a significant difference. Right church, wrong pew. Gives us something to work with. I appreciate your honesty. This is really important. Okay? So, so it's a great question, but I there's more to it than no verbiage. It's 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 the environment in which you the the verbiage is stated. I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, how do we get our ivory tower dental schools to unlearn and change? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's so sad. It's so sad. Um, I could tell you, um, uh, um, many, many years ago, one of my best friends in dental school, um, became the Dean of my school. And um, I, this won't, I guess that doesn't surprise most people who know me. I was not top of my class in, 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 in dental school. This guy was. Um, and he became dean. And I was practicing in, um, in, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And I get this phone call from, from Tom. And uh, he said, it's great to hear it. Wow, it's great to hear from you. And he goes on and says, um, you know, I just called to tell you that there's somebody using your name going around the country talking on sleep and pain. <laughs> and I said, no, no, Tom, that, that, that's me. And he said, no. <laughs> so long story short, he invited me out to Pittsburgh um, uh, to become, uh, to sit and talk to him about what we could do in pain. And he's an oral surgeon and he loved the concepts that, that I wanted to bring and, and I said, I would be willing to go in and do everything I can. I'll, I'll teach the program. I'll teach your faculty to teach the program. I'll create the program. I will charge you nothing. Nothing. I, not my point. Harry, this is great. Long story short, months passed. I didn't hear from him. Eventually, when I, when I finally would take the call, because he wouldn't take my call, because he was embarrassed. He said, yeah, well, I presented your concepts to the prosto department and, and the, clue, the, the ortho department. And, uh, you know, um, the ortho department strikes you funny, right? It's strange. Why would ortho want to take responsibility for TMD that they, for when many of their patients develop some joint dysfunction follow, following the removal of bands, and yet they want to take responsibility and they want to they suggest that for the TMD patients need orthotherapy except when they did it. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, and then when, when you, we, I just wrote an article with Daniel Manfredini on the, the lack of relationship 
the TMD occlusal relationship. Um, that if anybody would like a copy of it, I'll just email me at drbglass, drbglass at gmail.com. I'm an AAP, uh, AACP member. So you, uh, you, you can get that, get it, I think from the, from the list, but anyway, that's it. Dr. B glass at gmail.com. And I'll, I'll send you that in anything you'd like, but uh, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's so, it's so unbelievably frustrating. Do I have hope that the specialty development in the long run will be, uh, will, will, well, yeah, but I, 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 I only wish I were a little younger so I could spear around when the fireworks start, when a member of, uh, who is a, a, an oral facial pain specialist starts going into the faculty and start, starts dealing with evidence in dentistry with the occlusal departments and the periodontal departments and the, uh, and, and, and the, and the prostate departments. I mean, it's, it, it's, I think it's potential disaster and it's going to be a long time, but in the short time, this is great. I'm sorry to carry on, but in the short uh, uh, message is do not be um, upset or concerned about the development of a specialty. I understand the relationships that existed in the, and the, and the, egos and the personalities and, and all the power struggles that occurred between two two uh, groups. I get it. It doesn't mean anything to you and to me. Do not be concerned about the specialty. Just like endodontics is especially the vast majority of endodontics is done by general dentists. All it's going to do, it's, it, but it does raise, it does raise the, the bar. The kinds of things I talked about tonight are the kinds of things we need to at least consider. We've got if we're going to do things, they've got to be guided by the science. Your art guided by the science. No one is taking your art away from you. Your art, the science, to me, it, it all changes as soon as I teach. As soon as I teach, I feel a, a, a more awesome responsibility that when I teach, I make sure that when I teach the science, my, the people who are with me know that. And when I teach my art, they know that too. I hope that answered the question, but it's frustrating. It's, it, there's no easy answer there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the only other question you said, if the portion uh, that we skipped over, people can, can message you for more um, information about the skipped parts of the lecture on the anterior midpoint stops. So the, so the portion that on the anterior midpoint stops, it's rather clear. I think what you'll get a kick out of what, uh, I'm really sorry I couldn't get to it. There's a, there's a, there's a section where we look at, and I, and I did this on over a hundred with corrected topograms, where we looked at condyles and we moved the move, put an appliance in, and then had the patient clench on the appliance and take the corrected topograms. And of course, we're just telling you, you don't see the condyle go up and back the way you you would see on an on an articulator. So, so the the sense that that we were going to compress the condyle and force the disc further out of place with an anterior midpoint stop just doesn't happen. It's my appliance of choice when I've got an internal derangement. And I've had patients in them for years. Uh, the suggestion that there's super eruption doesn't occur. The suggestion that there's a, a potential increased potential for anterior open bite does occur, but there's an answer for that. Uh, and there's a way to look at the phenotype and determine on which patients that's more likely to happen. The suggestion that there's intrusion of the anterior teeth will host a study. And that, so all of that is all going to be on the PDF that uh, Shailen and, and AACP has for you. So you can look at it, but if it raises questions and you'd like to discuss it, um, it's what I do. So don't hesitate um, to call me, email me, email me at drbglass at gmail.com and I'll arrange a time and we can get on, um, get on, uh, get on a call. I'd be very happy to do that. But the, but the slides will be part of the PDF. Perfect. All right, well, that is our time for tonight. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Glassman. Again, tonight's webinar is being recorded and it'll be emailed to all registrants um, within 10 to 14 business days. Thank you all. All right, thanks, have a great night.